Yo, what's going on people? It's your boy Ape Poncho, and this is the story of one of the UK's deadliest firearms. Now, when we talk of firearms in the UK, especially from our overseas viewers, the stereotype that may come to mind would be, yeah, the UK has guns, but it's muskets or old World War II guns. And to that, I would say, yes, you're correct. These guns are still around the UK. But what you may not realise is that, yes, the UK, like many other places in the world, along with America, has its fair share of gun crime and not just with an old rusty revolver or a shotgun. Now granted, yes, the UK's gun crime is far lower than that of America, but for one, you got to take into account that the UK is extremely small. In fact, you can fit roughly 35 of the Great British Isles into the United States of America. So yes, a lot of the gun crime that does happen in the UK does normally involve some kind of shotgun or wartime handgun, but sometimes military grade pistols and machine guns are used in crimes that happen in the UK and this story we're about to get into follows one of them. But first, the class that died massacred by a crazed gunman, parents in anguish as the grim news spread. The killer was a local man with a known grudge. Tonight, a traumatized community is changed forever. Good evening. In three appalling minutes today, in the small city of Dunblane in central Scotland, 16 children were murdered. On the 13th of March, 1996, at around 8.15am, a 43-year-old man by the name Thomas Hamilton would leave his home on Kent Road in Stirling, Scotland and head for the Dunblane Primary School. Once he reached the school at around 9.30am, he parked his van in the car park near to a telegraph pole. There, he cut all the cables at the bottom of the telegraph pole, which served to the nearby houses, and then made his way across the car park towards the school buildings. Upon entering the school, he was armed with, at the time, four legally held handguns, two 9mm Browning HP pistols and two Smith & Wesson M19 Magnum revolvers, and he also had 743 rounds of ammunition on him. Once he made it to the school, he headed towards the northwest side near to the toilets and the school's gymnasium. And as he entered the first door, it's believed that he fired two shots into the assembly hall and the girls' toilets. In the gym, a class of 28 year one or first grade pupils were preparing for a PE or physical education class, along with three adult members of staff. When he entered the gymnasium, he was confronted by the teacher taking charge of the lesson, Eileen Harold, and it was then he started shooting at random very rapidly. He shot Eileen, who was hit in her arms and chest as she attempted to protect herself, and he continued to shoot up the gymnasium. Eileen, along with several children who were injured, had stumbled to cover into the open plan store cupboard at the side of the gym. Gwen Mayer, the teacher of the year one class, was shot and killed instantly, and the third adult present, Mary Blake, who was a supervisory assistant, was shot in the head and both legs, but she had also managed to make her way to the cupboard along with several more injured children. The damage inflicted in the gym at that point had resulted in 29 shots being fired from one of the pistols, killing one child and injuring several others. Hamilton then turned his direction to the east side of the gym, firing six shots as he walked and then fired eight shots towards the opposite end of the gym. After this, he made his way back to the center of the gym and fired 16 shots at point blank range at a group of children who had been injured from shots fired just moments earlier. A pupil who heard the commotion coming from inside the gym had walked up to one of the windows to check out what was happening and it was there Hamilton had shot in the direction of the pupil who was subsequently injured by the flying glass before running away. From where Hamilton was now standing, he would go on to fire a further 30 shots in various directions. He then exited the gym via a fire exit, firing another four shots towards the cloakroom of the library, and he hit Grace Tweel, another member of staff at the school, and here she was injured, but it was non-life-threatening. A mobile classroom which was close by the fire exit where Hamilton was standing was to next fall victim. Teacher Catherine Gordon had saw him firing shots and told her class to get down on the floor, and then Hamilton would go on to fire nine bullets into the classroom. One of the bullets had passed through a chair where a child had been sitting literally seconds before the shots had rang out. He would then turn his attention back to the gym, would go on to drop his pistol, had taken out one of the revolvers he had on him. This time, he turned the revolver on himself. Throughout the terrifying ordeal, a total of 32 people had been inflicted with gunshot wounds over a period of around three to four minutes. 
deaths. 17 people had unfortunately died, including, as previously stated, Gwen Mayer and 16 primary school students. All were killed at the scene, apart from one who had passed away on the way to hospital. In response to the killing, unlike we've seen in America in recent years, due to public outcry and debate, John Major's Conservative Party introduced the Firearms Amendment Act of 1997, which banned all cartridge ammunition handguns, with the exception of 22 caliber single shot weapons in England, Scotland and Wales. Following a 1997 general election, Tony Blair's Labour government would introduce the Firearms Amendment No. 2 Act of 1997, which went on to ban the remaining handguns. This meant that only muzzle-loading and historic handguns were now legal, as well as certain sporting handguns that fell outside the Home Office's definition of a handgun due to the dimensions. So this is why when you see gun crime taking place in the UK, you don't very often see specific type of handguns being used. The next part in our story takes us a little further back to the early 80s and we head over to Birmingham, United Kingdom. Due to a rise in race tensions between white police officers and local ethnic communities, we would see the birth of the 1985 Handsworth riots, which was triggered by a raid in the Villa Cross public house and arrests at Acapulco Cafe. Again, the local communities feeling that the police were harassing and targeting them due to their race. Around this time, right-wing extremist groups and racists would also be extremely active around Birmingham, trying to oppress and racially attack ethnic minorities. So, just like their cousins over in America, that being the Crips, whether intentionally doing the same thing or not, a group of men, just like those guys in LA would come together to protect their community. So groups of young black and Asian men would come together in the Lazils, Handsworth and Bolso Heath areas to form a vigilante style gang, again to protect their communities from outsiders. By the late 1980s, after a few years, the group would take on the name The Johnson's Crew, named after The Johnson's Cafe, which was a hangout and meeting spot for the group. But what started off as good intentions, along with the Crips over in America, would soon turn bad. Once the right-wing threat had disappeared from the streets of Birmingham in the late 80s, early 90s, along with the emergence of crack cocaine and heroin, the market would start to boom on the streets of Birmingham and The Johnson Crew were hungry for some of the drugs trade. The Johnson's in the the emergence of the crack trade had started to notice that the Yardies, or people who are native to Jamaica who now live in the UK, were booming in the trade and were said to have been bullying and threatening some of the local Johnson crew members who they had considered soft. And some of the tactics enforced by the Yardies would include kidnap, torture, shooting at people and beating people up badly. With an enemy on the streets, the Johnsons would now be at war with the Yardies for the following years. At some point in the 90s, it was reported that some Johnsons members had fallen out with each other due to a falling out over a bet on who won a game of Street Fighter on the PlayStation, but this isn't 100% confirmed. After this fallout, whether due to the rumour or not, it would see the emergence of a break-off set called the Burger Bar Boys. The name Burger Bar Boys would hail from a local hangout spot called the Burger Bar on Soho Road. Now, even though the two gangs had a rivalry with each other, they would both continue to be at war with the Yardies, and eventually when the Yardies wasn't a threat to either organisation, they would turn on each other to take control of the drugs trade on the streets of Birmingham. So, the Burger Bar Boys territory would be located in Smethwick and Handsworth, and the Johnson's crew would be located in Aston and Lazelles. Tit-for-tat gangland shootings, stabbings would take place throughout their beefs, and they became so feared on the streets of Birmingham that no one would speak to the police regarding any of their doings, and this would make both crews judge, jury, and executioner. Even though the war between the Burger Bar Boys and the Johnson's crew had been going on for roughly five years by 2003, everything was kept quiet and nothing ever reached national news until January the 2nd, 2003. It was a crime which shocked the nation and exposed the horror of gangland violence on the streets of Britain. Ten years ago today, two teenage girls, Letitia Shakespeare and Charlene Ellis, were shot dead in Birmingham, the innocent victims of gun crime. So the war had now reached national headlines after Burger Bar members had fired a hail of bullets from a Mac-10 machine pistol outside a hair salon in Birchfield Road, Aston, which is known Johnson Territory. The intended target was a Johnson's crew member, but instead 17-year-old Letitia Shakespeare and 18-year-old Charlene Ellis 
were hit. During the investigation, it was revealed, just as I stated before, that the shooting was a result of the ongoing feud between the Burger Bar Boys and the Johnson crew, and this was a retaliation hit for the murder of Burger Bar Boys member Johan Martin, who was shot to death in a drive-by shooting while sitting in his car in West Bromwich in December of 2002. Four men were convicted of Letitia and Charlene's murder, and further charges of attempted murder at Leicester Crown Court in March of 2005, and they were Mark Ellis, who was Charlene's half-brother, Michael Gregory, and Nathan Martin, who was Johan's brother, and they were all sentenced to serve a minimum sentence of 35 years in prison. Rodrigo Sims, being younger at the time of the shooting, so played a lesser role, was sentenced to serve a minimum of 27 years. On a quick side note, this was the first trial in England at which the witnesses were allowed to remain anonymous, showing how serious and dangerous it was going up against the Burger Bar boys, and the same thing would have happened if it was the Johnson's crew. So, one month later after the shooting, gun number 6 would make its first appearance on the streets of Birmingham. But how did the gun receive its name? After investigating gangland shootings throughout Birmingham, the West Midlands police would make a report from multiple bits of evidence to come up with a profile of 10 guns that were circulating in and around Birmingham that were connected to these shootings. A key role into spotting if a gun was used on multiple occasions is the marking it leaves on the bullet cases that are found in a crime scene. You can think of it as a fingerprint for a specific firearm, each gun has its own specific fingerprint it leaves on the casing once fired. Out of the 10 guns, one which stuck out from the rest was gun number 6, which is a black CZ-75 semi-automatic pistol made in the Czech Republic. And so enters the first shooting involving gun number 6. On the 23rd of February 2003, at around 2.55am on Proctor Street, a shooting would take place in Johnson's crew territory. The only scientific evidence that is found is two bullet casings. No CCTV footage is recovered, no mobile evidence is recovered, and no one comes forward to talk to the police. In fact, the only way the police knew that a shooting had ever happened was the fact that an anonymous caller had phoned them to let them know. No one to this day has ever come forward about this shooting, and it remains unsolved. After the shooting, police believed that the gun was in possession of a Johnson's Crew gang member, but it's uncertain whether this was a retaliation for the New Year's party murder. Just over a month later, the second shooting takes place over in George Street West on the 24th of March 2003. At around 2.30pm, a gang thought to be members of the Johnson's Johnson crew or associated with the gang are seen walking through shops with the gun at around 2.30pm. They ask for details of another gang thought to be the Burger Bar boys and once the Burger Bar boys emerge, members of the Johnson's crew are seen getting into a car before speeding off, chasing after their rivals, shooting them from the car in a high speed chase. Several bullet casings are found throughout residential streets after the pursuit, but after a full police investigation into the incident, once again they had run into problems when witnesses were unable to identify the gunman. Again, the second incident to this day remains unsolved. Twelve weeks later, gun number six would re-emerge in Winds and Green on the 13th of June 2003. At this current time, I can't find the specific street, but it would be at around 11.30pm. A car thought to contain Johnson's crew gang members pulled up to a 24-year-old man at the front of his house. When they drove by, they opened fire, hitting the man six times in his hands, arm, back and neck before driving away. After the man had been shot, the people who was in the house he was staying at had came out and cleaned the crime scene with bleach. Even though the police would come out to say that this was a case of attempted murder because the victim had survived, he went on to tell police that this was a case of mistaken identity and police believe he refused to cooperate. Again, to this day, the case remains unsolved. A day later, the gun re-emerges and a car pulls up to a nightclub entrance in Lazelle's Birmingham at around 4.50am, again thought to be Johnson's crew gang members. Once the car passes the nightclub, it opens fire. A man is shot in the leg, but he goes home before calling an ambulance, and when questioned by police, he refused to talk to them, as in all cases before, no witnesses come forward, and again, this case remains unsolved. Just over a month later, the gun re-emerges on the 20th of August 2003, again in the Windsor area. This time, the youngest of all victim to gun number six, being a 19-year-old man, was at a telephone box making a phone call at around 1.30am. A car pulls up to the side of the phone box. The 19-year-old makes his way to the car, but seemingly runs in the opposite direction when the gunman decides to open fire, hitting him in his back and his foot. He doesn't give police any information regarding the situation, and the attempted murder case once again goes unsolved. After a nine-month hiatus, the gun then shows up this time in Birmingham City 
Centre on the 9th of May 2004. I can't find any reports, but it's thought that Johnson Crew and Burger Bar Boys gang members had bumped into each other after a night out. At around 4.30am, a gangland shooting would take place on the streets of the city centre, this time hitting a parked car in a car park. A young woman was sleeping in the vehicle and luckily she escaped uninjured. Once again, the case goes unsolved. 19 days later, on the 28th of June 2004, at around 11.17pm, the gun re-emerges once again, this time in Hockleybrook Close in Birmingham. The gun is still thought to be in the possession of Johnson's gang members at this point. A car would pull up to the cul-de-sac and they would fire shots into parked vehicles. When police arrive, they find £3,000 worth of heroin in one of the cars that's riddled with bullets. A shot is also fired through the wall of a neighbour's house, which entered the bedroom, but the neighbours had refused to give a formal statement to police. Once again, the case goes unsolved. Three and a half months later, on the 2nd of October 2004, at around 10.55pm, shots are fired from a car in a high-speed car chase on Fimble Mill Lane in Aston. And at this point, the police believe that the gun is still in possession of the gang. Five bullet casings were found in the road and even though there was CCTV evidence and witness statements, the vehicles were never identified and the case would go unsolved. At this point, police would go on to say it was like chasing shadows as they hadn't arrested anyone in connection to the previous shootings and it was a ticking time bomb in regards to the fact that it would be only a matter of time before someone went on to lose their lives. And then came the early morning of the 20th of November 2004. On the night of the 19th of November 2004, which led into the 20th, members of the Johnson crew were rushing doors, which meant they were pushing their way through bars and club doors in order to get in, which prevented the doormen from challenging them from entering the premises. They had successfully done this to one nightclub in Digbeth and then moved on to the Promotion nightclub on Bristol Street through fire exit doors via an alleyway at around 3.30am. As they attempted to enter the nightclub, they would be confronted by small Heath doormen, Ishfa armoured and he stopped them from entering the nightclub. After he and other doormen had ushered the men from the Johnson's crew away, they were making various threats towards them. After successfully being removed from the fire exit, the doormen had followed them out onto the street and unfortunately for Ishvak, for him standing up to the gang and doing his job, he would pay the price of his life. As the doormen were about to turn back after following them, shots would ring out hitting club owner Mr. Colleen in his abdomen and two bouncers were injured during the shooting but Ishvak had been fatally shot. He was shot in his shoulder which travelled through his chest, shattering the main blood vessel in his abdomen. After a trial at Birmingham Crown Court, six members of the Johnson crew and associates, that being Dean Smith, William Carter, Cole Spencer, Michael Christie, Leonard Wilkins and Jamal Parchment were all sentenced to serve a minimum of 30 years in prison. So police would finally bring members of the Johnson crew to justice after the past couple of years of gun number six being used on the streets of Birmingham. But unfortunately for them, although a conviction, gun number six would still be out on the streets. After this shooting, this would be the last time the gun would be in the hands of a Johnson's crew gang member. So whose hands would the infamous gun number six end up in next? Well, eight months after the gun was used to kill doorman Ishvak Ahmed, the gun would end up in the hands of a man from Tottenham known as Keith. Whitaker. On the night of the 23rd of July 2005, 31-year-old Andrew Huntley had been on a night out with his girlfriend in Digbeth. He was heading towards Air Nightclub when he received a call from Kimar, which had made him angry. Phone evidence shows that Andrew was queuing up outside the club waiting to get in when he was then confronted by Kimar Whitaker and Tashan Bernard. A witness said he heard one of the two men shout in former and then Andrew went on to be punched in the face. Andrew had then run off under a railway bridge and was pursued by Kimo and he was then shot 10 times by gun number 6. According to witnesses, his last words were, we are brothers, we don't have to live like this. Of the 10 bullets that were fired, 2 had went through his brain. And after a trial at Birmingham Crown Court in March of 2006, Kimo Whitaker was found guilty of murdering Andrew Huntley and was sentenced to serve a minimum of 30 years before being considered for parole. Deshaun Bernard was cleared of the murder but was found guilty of assisting an offender due to him taking Kimo to a quote unquote safe house in Sutton Coalfield. Even though the firearm residue was later found by police in the vehicle which was dumped by the pair, once again, gun number six was never found. So, with gun number six still out on the streets, who would 
the gun end up in the hands of next? Well, the last and final shooting that's been reported would take place nearly four years after the murder of Andrew Huntley. And if you guys watch my video on Joshua Wright Beera, aka Depsman, then you would have heard me briefly speak about this before. After meeting Depsman's mum, Alison, Anselm Wright Beera would start doing petty crime as he would enter adulthood. After Depsman was born, Anselm would get into more serious crime, such as burglary, and Alison had decided to leave him because he couldn't give up his life of crime. When Depsman had turned five, the road Anselm was going down took a turn for the worse when he ended up getting caught up in an armed robbery, and after leaving prison, he would spend time with other known petty criminal brothers, Declan and Christopher Morrissey. In September of 2008, Anselm was classed as wanted on the police national computer after his DNA was matched to evidence recovered from two post office robberies. One was an armed raid in a post office in Romsley on March the 25th, 2008, and the other one was six miles away at Cruton Hackett Post Office on May the 9th, 2008. And he was also suspected of carrying out a third robbery at a pub on August the 25th, 2008. After the success of previous robberies either accounted for or not, the three then planned to rob a post office in January of 2009. The plan was to go ahead and they decided on robbing a post office in the village of Fairfield about 20 miles away from Birmingham city centre. When the trio arrived in a car at around 8.20am, they swiftly jumped out and entered the post office with balaclavas. Anselm was armed with gun number six and one of the brothers was armed with a sledgehammer. Craig Hudson Walker had ran down after hearing the commotion in an attempt to defend his parents and it would be at this point, as you can see on the CCTV, that Anselm would shoot Craig at point blank range in the heart. His father, Ken Hudson Walker, was shot in the leg during the robbery gone wrong. Four days later, the trio would go on to be arrested and would stand on trial later on in the year after the botched robbery. And in December of 2009, after a 10 week trial, the trio were jailed for life with Anselm being found guilty of attempted murder where he received a 34 year prison sentence. He was found guilty of murder where he was sentenced to 34 years imprisonment and he was found guilty of possessing a firearm with intent to endanger life or to enable another person by means thereof to endanger life where he was sentenced to 21 years and all sentences were to run concurrent. Even after getting a massive case like this with lots of evidence and a massive case in support of the prosecution, to this day gun number six has never been found. Now what's interesting about gun number six is the fact that the shootings progressively got worse with the last three on the list being murders. Again the gun is still out there and police have never recovered it but in my opinion I think the weapon has been destroyed more than likely by Anselm due to him more than likely knowing he killed someone so he would have wanted to get rid of the weapon. But then again maybe it could still be out there and one day we may see another person fall victim to gun number six which I really hope isn't the case. And that's the story of one of the UK's deadliest firearms. If you like this story video and you want to see more like this give the video a little like and let me know what you guys think of this down in the comment section below. And if you want the latest drill, street and music news out of the UK be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. It's been your boy Ape Honcho and I'm out.